Good morning. We're so glad that you could be here to join us in worship this morning. If you're able, would you please stand as we begin? I'm going to keep on singing. I'm going to keep on shouting. I'm going to keep on lifting my voice and let the world know Jesus saves. I'm going to keep on marching. Good morning. Welcome to Verndale Alliance Church. I'm glad that you are able to be here, both in this room and the video cafe, and also to those uh, watching at home. Uh, make sure if you are a first-time visitor to stop by the Welcome Center and receive a, a gift for coming to worship this morning with us. Uh, would you bow your heads and pray with me this morning? Father, I thank you for uh, this day, Lord, that you have given. Lord, I thank you for this place that we can, we can come together, we can worship, we can fellowship together. Lord, I thank you for technology, uh, even though sometimes it can be a pain in the butt, Lord. It has uh, its, its uses and its benefits. And so, Lord, we thank you for the aspect that uh, there are those watching at home uh, many, many miles away, Lord. And we just thank you uh, for the opportunity uh, to be able to do that and for them uh, tuning in. <clears throat> Tuning in and watching, Lord. And Lord, I just pray for uh, this service today. Lord, I just pray that uh, everything that is said and done uh, would bring you glory, would bring you honor. Lord, we just pray for your Holy Spirit to minister uh, to your people here and to, to those watching, Lord. And uh, Lord, we just again thank you uh, for who you are, for your love for us. Uh, and Lord, may we emulate that love uh, to others today, Lord. And we just ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. A few announcements for you. Uh, this coming Saturday, uh, there's the men's breakfast uh, at 8 a.m. for all the guys, so come out for that if you are able. Uh, mom's group is March 7th. I believe that's Tuesday, uh, 9 a.m. The address is in your bulletin for where that is going to be held. Uh, we have our mother-son banquet. Uh, last I know, we had about 28 sons and 20 moms signed up, and that was, I think, last week that I knew that, and so uh, praise God for that. If you need help, like a certain uh, senior pastor needed help, you can come talk to me, and I can get you registered uh, if need be, and so uh, we look forward to, to seeing you at that event. Uh, that is uh, March 11th at 5 o'clock. A uh, couple other announcements. Uh, due to the new furnaces uh, being put up and muddy sidewalks and, and whatnot, uh, Children's Church, and then also on Wednesday as well, we will not be able to use uh, the sound booth entrance uh, in that sidewalk. And so, sorry kids, you're going to have to walk around uh, today. I'll be sure to stand at the door as kind of the bouncer so you don't so you don't get through. So uh, that's why I'll be standing back there to direct you. Uh, and so uh, head to the back, and that will include, obviously, Sunday school uh, as well this morning. And then there we are shooting to have a children's slash youth choir for Easter Sunday. Uh, and so that's going to be for uh, 
youth and children ages 5 to 18. Uh, and the practices for that is going to start next week, and the practices is going to run during uh, Children's Church. And so if you're interested or have questions about that, uh, Rachel Johnson is the person to ask about that. Uh, with that, would you please stand as we continue to worship this morning?
it up up here. So we'll go to prayer this morning. Got just a couple of requests for us. First of all, for Mrs. Carrie Jensen. Jessen, she had foot surgery this week, so pray for a recovery for her. And then uh, Roxanne Lundin's son, Justin, was in a snowmobile accident, and uh, he injured his left hand, and he's left-handed, and he's a mechanic, and the injury is serious. And so pray for... Uh, Doctors, surgeons that will be working with him for direction for them and for healing for Justin. Let's bow together in prayer. Father, we come into your presence this morning so thankful that you are faithful always. Thank you for your presence with us, that you are the everlasting, unchanging God who watches over us and cares for us, that you as the God of creation know us personally. Thank you for your presence, for your love and your care. Thank you, Lord, for the promise that you have given to us that you will complete the good work that you have begun in us. And I thank you, Lord, for how you are moving and working in hearts and lives. Lord, we look at the world around us sometimes and we become discouraged as we see the changes that are taking place and decisions that are being made. But at the same time, as we look, we see the moving of God and the working of God in hearts and lives. And we pray, Father, for you to continue to open hearts and minds to your truth. Lord, we confess this morning that we do believe. We believe in your word. We believe in the cross. We believe in the resurrection of Jesus. We believe that you are coming again. We thank you for the hope that is ours in Christ. 
Lord, may we hang on to that in the midst of the challenges that come our way. May we hang on to that hope as we face obstacles, as we face trials in life, to know that you're walking with us and you are at work accomplishing your good purpose. Father, we lift up these requests to you this morning. I pray for Carrie. I pray that you would help her to recover from this surgery. I pray that that would go well. Uh, Lord, that you would minister to that need. And Father, we want to pray for Justin today. We lift him up to you, and, and we pray, Father, that you would guide the surgeons to know what to do and how to treat this, how to care for him. We pray for healing for this hand, that, Lord, he would uh, get full use of that hand once again. We just ask you to, uh, to give him relief from the pain that he's been experiencing. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would watch over him and care for him and minister to his every need through this. We pray for Roxanne as well, that you would give her peace as she watches her son go through this, minister to her at this time. Father, we thank you for what you're doing through the life and ministry of this church. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to keep our eyes on you, to remain faithful to you and what you've called us to. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would move and work through all the various ministries of the church to your praise and glory. And I pray for Pastor as he comes and brings a message this morning, that your hand would be upon him, that you would anoint and empower him and speak through him this morning. And we'll thank you and praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you please stand if you're able as we continue in worship? What gift of grace, Jesus, my Redeemer, there is no more for heaven now to give. My joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless joys. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine. I can say all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. The night is dark, but I am not forsaken, for by my side the Savior he I labor on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need his power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me. Through the deepest valley he will lead. Oh, the night. Shall overcome, yet not I, but through Christ in me. No fate I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price is. For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon, and he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold, my sin has been defeated. Jesus now and ever is my plea. Oh, the chains are released, I can sing, I am free, yet not I, but through Christ in me. With every breath, I long to follow. 
Jesus, for he has said that he will bring me home, and day by day I know he will renew me, until I stand with joy before the throne. To this I is complete still my lips shall repeat yet not i but through christ in me to this i hold my hope is only jesus all the glory evermore to him when the race is complete still my lips shall Christ in me. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, and not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ. bow your heads with me. Lord Jesus, it is not us, but it is you, Lord. We can know, we can have confidence that the night has been won, that you have overthrown the grave, and that if we believe in you, that we have victory in you, with you, that we can someday stand before you, Lord. And I pray that it would be the prayer of all of our hearts that when we stand before you, we will hear, well done, thy good and faithful servant. It's hard each day, Lord. Sometimes this world is a hard place to live in, but we can know that we don't have to do it alone that you will lead and you will guide. And all we have to do is look to you, Lord. I ask that as the service continues, Lord, would you anoint Pastor Tony as he brings your word, Lord. You have a specific message for each one of us here today. You have divinely brought each and every one of us to this place. And you have something for us to hear. And so I pray that whatever we're holding on to, whatever is in our minds right now, Lord, I pray that we would be able to set that aside and that we can hear from you this morning. I ask all of these things in your name. Amen. You may be seated. And at this time, children ages three through fourth grade are dismissed for children's church. Remember, don't use that sound door. Some years ago, I invented a holiday, uh, March 1st day. It was a, a, a mental day of, of uh, uh, celebrating the hope of spring. Uh, this year, uh, and, and you only sell, the, the way you celebrate is just wear a short sleeve shirt on March 1st. That's the only, the only tenant of the holiday. This year, I wore a short sleeve shirt under a long sleeve shirt and a sweater because of the snow, but my daughter wore shorts in honor of March 1st day, so hats off to Olivia for celebrating appropriately. Uh, the lies we tell ourselves, right? Uh, that March 1st is the beginning of spring and we're getting snow. Uh, that uh, uh, the things that are sometimes easy for us to convince ourselves of. Uh, this morning we want to continue our study in Philippians uh, in chapter 3, verses 1 to 11. There's, a, there's kind of a, a turning point here at the midpoint of this letter uh, about the things that people will believe. And the things that they will convince themselves of, contrary to truth and contrary to the evidence. So if you have your Bibles this morning, if you'd open, please, to Philippians chapter 3, 
beginning in verse 1 through verse 11. If you're following along in your study books, you'll be on page 23 this morning uh, of the study books. If you'd like to follow along there, you certainly can do so. Finally, my brother, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same thing again is no trouble to me, and it is a safeguard for you. Beware of the dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the false circumcision. For we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh, although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh. If anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. Circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. Whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ, and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, be conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. We have been examining uh, this book of Philippians from the perspective of how we might glean from it uh, lessons that will allow us to find joy in the journey of life. We began in chapter 1 by noting that if we are going to find joy in the journey, uh, that we are to look in the right places, that we are to look for joy in the fellowship of the body of Christ and joy for the purpose of God even in our sufferings and in the Christ-centered life. Uh, in chapter 2, we examined how we are to look at the right examples. First, the supreme example of Christ, and the last time we were together, the examples of ordinary people. That joy is to be found in service and in sacrifice for the cause of Christ, for His glory and for the help of others. Now this morning, as we come to this third chapter, we want to examine another component of how it is that we might find joy in the journey of life, particularly in the hard spots and the hard places. And today, what we want to look at, and this, this week and next, is that we can find joy in the journey if we put our trust, our confidence, in the right things. If we choose truth over Lies, And particularly what we're looking at this morning is, is who do we need to know or trust if we are to answer the big questions of life? And there's really no bigger question in life than the question of how do I get right before God? As Paul is writing this letter to the church in Philippi and we receive it as the inspired word of God, uh, we have to recognize that that question is still a pressing question. Not only is it a pressing question for those on the front side, those who do not yet know Christ, but it is a pressing question for the church to understand and to get right. It's important for the church to recognize that when we, when we give a message, when we, when we put forth the truth of how it is that we come to know Christ, that, that we get the answer right in that regard. That we guard ourselves and are careful against error that might come in. And whenever you go to answer this type of question, there's really two uh, buckets that you put your answer into. There is the things that I must do, or there is the thing that God has done. There is works that I perform, or there is faith. And, and, and we live at a time, and, and have lived in times, where, where it seems that there are many who want to marry those two things together. That it is somehow, uh, that, that I have to, to work up something so that God might do some part on my behalf. And, and, and that's what Paul is getting at in the heart of this. He's, he's talking about, about how it is that we, we know to put our trust in the right things, in the right places, in the right truth, if you were. As he does this, he uses his own life story to, to sort of paint the picture for us, to set these two approaches in stark contrast. Paul had quite an interesting biography, an interesting backstory. If you read the book of Acts, you'd get some insights into him. He refers to himself in the scriptures as the, the chief of all sinners. And yet you and I look at him, and rightly so, through the lens of looking back, and, and we see the greatest missionary and church planter in church history. And how is it that we can reconcile these two realities? How can we reconcile the, the biography of Paul before he meets Jesus and the biography of Paul after he meets Jesus? And of course, the answer to that is Jesus. The answer to that is he put his trust, his stock, in the right places. As this chapter opens, it's interesting the terminology he uses, verse 2. He says, beware of the dogs. 
Uh, that's not a phrase that we use very often. Uh, when I hear someone say dog, I think of something I want to meet. I love dogs. I love my dogs. I love other people's dogs. There's only been one dog in the entire world that I've ever met that I have not loved. And it was a little Australian terrier that we bought named Oscar. And he was a dog worth hating. And so he moved on to bigger and better things than my house. But with that exception, when I hear dogs, so, so I want us to be careful that when we read this, we don't think, oh, why would I want to beware of, of dogs? In, in, in Paul's days, he's writing this, this, this is a, a supreme insult of character, if you will. Because dogs in that time weren't pets. They weren't, they weren't the companion that you hung out with on a cold winter's night. They were scurvy and mangy and scroungy animals. They, 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 were, they were seen for their, their, their filth. And they were undesirable. And he's using this, this supreme insult. And he's, gonna be, he's talking about people. He's talking about a certain type of person. And this, this, this chapter opens with this, with this beware of dogs. And so we want to kind of understand what that is. And what he's talking about here, ladies and gentlemen. He goes on to describe his evil workers in the false circumstances. He's talking about false teachers in the church. Specifically, as we're going to see this morning, he's talking about the Judaizers and the false teaching of legalism. But I want us to recognize at the onset of this that, that you could apply what we're going to look at this morning across a wide spectrum of categorizing false teaching and false teachers. Let's take just a moment this morning, if you'll indulge me, and let's look at a couple of passages for this. Let's go back to Acts chapter 17. This is not in your notes. This is a, this is a freebie. Uh, and then we'll get back to what we're going to talk about this morning and, uh, and, and hopefully move right along and, and get us where we need to be. Look at Acts chapter 17, verses 10 uh, and through 12. Familiar passage to some of you. This is the Bereans. And you might know that the Bereans are known in Scripture for their, their diligence. It says, Then brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea, and when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica. So why was it? For they received the word with great eagerness, examining the Scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Therefore many of them, it says, believed, along with a number of prominent Greeks, women, and men. When we're talking this morning about where it is that we put our trust, when we're considering seriously the warning of Paul, beware of the dogs, beware of false teachers, the first place our mind typically might run if we're familiar with the story is to this portion of the book of Acts. And it's interesting to note that these Berean believers, these Bereans that heard, that there's, there's some things that are noted. On the positive side of this, they received, it said, the word. That is that they came together and they heard what was truth and they took that truth. And then it says they took what was said and they were diligent to examine the scriptures daily. Now anytime you read in the New Testament that there's a church or a group of people that examine the scriptures daily, they were reading the Old Testament. They were going back to the scriptures that they had that you and I have as our Old Testament of the Bible. And we won't this morning take our time to examine all of the ways that we find Christ in the pages of the Old Testament. But what we do find, as we sang this morning, is we find the God who does not change, how he deals with man and their sin. And so these guys in Berea, these guys and ladies, they were examining the scriptures, it says, daily, and then out of that, there were many that believed. And so we have there, I think, the formula, if you're looking for a, a word to attach to it, of, 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 of how you craft an antidote to false teaching in the church. You come together to receive truth. Not just from the person standing in front of you, but you come together to receive truth in, in, in your small groups, and you come together in your living rooms, and you come together in your classes, and you come together. We don't want to be too individualistic here. One of the problems I think we have in the church in America today is we have individualized everything, and so you can go ahead and sort of just chase the founding of truth somewhere else and just sort of make that your truth and spiritualize it. There is a necessity to the weight of the history of orthodox believing, of, of genuine, true Christian faith. And you find that and you, and you, you solidify that and you, you, you guard that and receive that as we come together in settings like this. And so that's the picture that's drawn here. This wasn't Berean believers at home alone in their easy chair reading the daily bread in the Bible. These were people coming together. It says they went to the synagogue. And there they received the truth. They examined the scriptures to see if what they heard was true. So they took responsibility for verifying that. And then it says out of that came belief. 
And if you and I are going to take the warning seriously to stand against false teaching, and again, we're going to look in a moment specifically at legalism, but for now we want to recognize that we have to be willing to receive, to examine, and then believe. We have to be vigilant, if you will, in this regard. That's the positive antidote to false teaching. Go to Galatians for a moment. I want to give us the negative antidote to that. Because you not only have to receive truth, but there's another side to that coin. Galatians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. Paul is, is correcting the church here in Galatia. We won't read the whole section. We'll just grab a couple of verses. Verse 8, But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we preach to you, he is to be accursed. As we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. What is he saying here? The negative side, the negative antidote, if you will, to, false, to receiving false teaching is to reject it. The implication here is as you lay down what you hear next to what is the revealed truth of Scripture, it should become clear to us what is and is not truth. And you and I as believers, individually and corporately, have a responsibility to receive what is true and to call out and reject what is false. And we dare not be lazy in this regard. 2 Timothy 3.16 reminds us that all Scripture is God-breathed, is inspired by God, and is useful and so I would encourage you, ladies and gentlemen, this is a, just a side encouragement, then we'll, we'll get right back to the message of the day, I promise. Side encouragement to you. If you are not in the habit of reading through the Bible, I would encourage you to find a, a program, a plan, a, a schedule that works for you. If, you. if you're more of sort of a paratrooper, you drop in and read something and then jump out, I would encourage you to make sure you drop into the whole Bible. Don't get, don't get fixated. If the only Old Testament book you've ever read is Psalms, expand your reading library. It's important, ladies and gentlemen. It's important for us to not just be able to parrot what we are told we ought to believe. It is important for us to be able to say, this I know is truth. This is true. Not because my pastor said it, not because the, 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 my favorite author or radio program or television program said it, but because I have heard it and I have examined it and I find it to be true. There's a necessity for vigilance and discernment empowered and led by the Holy Spirit of God for the church today. We must be that people. And so Paul, now back to our text, he tells us, beware, he says, of dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of the false circumcision. So this morning what I want to do is look at two things. Paul is using his life story, this opening part of chapter 3, to lay down in stark contrast two different and divergent paths. One of them is the path that says you can, you can satisfy the needs of a holy God through your efforts by adding to what he has done what we tell you to do, or you cannot. Or it is by faith received. And so he's going to lay out first for all for us the dangers of legalism before he offers for us the benefits of faith. And he's using again his life story for this. And I would encourage you and remind you as we listen to this, as we focus in on his specific topic of legalism in his day, I believe that these principles, these truths can be applied across the spectrum of false teaching. So you can replace the word the dangers of legalism with the dangers of anything else that you might want to put there. The dangers of, of, of tolerating sin, the dangers of softening the gospel, the dangers of whatever it is, you can fill in the blank. And I believe these principles carry through. Let's find out first of all. He reminds the readers the central theme of joy. I want us to remember we're talking about joy in these days. It might be hard to understand and be aware of all these things, and, and, and we get nervous, but he says, listen, verse 1, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. He adds that phrase for us, rejoice in the Lord. It's fitting that he brings this together for us. Here's why I believe chapter 3, verse 1 starts with rejoicing, because I think that we should understand, as Paul does, that few things rob us of our joy, like putting our hope in faulty and false teaching. Few things will strip the joy out of your Christian life than falling under the sway of false teachers. Because they are workers of the enemy. They are not there to build joy. They are not there to build holiness. They are not there to build the name of Christ. They are there to rob you of what is yours in Christ for their own gain. And so this is an important dynamic for us to understand as we look at these dangers that might come. There ought to be for you and I no object that brings greater joy to us than the assurance we have of our faith in Christ. If you've, if you've faced difficult challenges, if we're talking about the journey of life and the hard spots that we sometimes run into, 
How many, if we stopped this morning right now, the preaching, and we just went around for testimonials, how many of you would be able to stand and say, the joy of the Lord is my strength. In that moment of darkness, in that moment of need, in that moment of, of fear, the Lord showed up. And he didn't have, I didn't have any more answers than I had before I started, perhaps. And I didn't get relief from my moment like I'd hoped. But the Lord was present, and in the Lord's presence there is joy. That's what it means to rejoice in the Lord, ladies and gentlemen. We can rejoice in the Lord as we grieve in our circumstances. We can rejoice in the Lord as we struggle in the hard place. Because the Lord is present. Because by His Spirit we are not alone. He's by the bedside. He's by the graveside. He's, he's in the hard places. And so Paul says, have rejoice. And he doesn't want you or I or the church in Philippi to lose that joy because of the false teachers. Because of the dogs that come to steal it from us. And so he's going to give us the dangers of legalism. He says there's a need for a safeguard. And then he zeroes in on the threat they pose. Number one, why is this so dangerous? Why do we need to beware of false teaching? How is it able to steal our joy in the journey of life? Number one, because it is subtle. Legalism, in particular, false teaching in general, is subtle. He describes the false teachers. He says they're dogs, evil workers, and the false circumcision. If you go to Acts chapter 15, we won't look there this morning, but you can read that as your own uh, extra reading this week if you'd like to. Acts chapter 15, there's a, uh, there's a, a dispute that erupts. There's a, there's, a, there's a meeting that has to be called a church meeting. Because there's this debate about whether or not people who are coming, Gentiles who are coming to faith in Christ, need to become Jewish before they can become saved. That's where the Judaizers made their hay. And they said, hey, they need to be circumcised and they need to, they need to follow the, the Old Testament rules otherwise it doesn't all count. So there was this debate that rose out of that. Did, did Gentiles need to convert to Judaism before they came to Christians? Did they have to follow the outward rules before they had the inward change? That was the question they wrestled with. And they called a meeting of the, the Council of the Apostles and they decided the matter. They said, no. Christ fulfilled that. that that's, the answer is Jesus. And so they answered the question and that should have been the end of it. How many of you have ever been engaged in or witnessed a debate of that magnitude and known that once the decision is made, it just kind of ends? Every, the, the people that lost the debate just go on quietly and say, well, I guess we lost. Is that how it works? It is not how it works. If you've never been in one of those meetings, never say yes if you're asked to join a committee. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. Particularly when you're so diametrically opposed as these folks were. So the losers didn't just go home quietly and think about their thought, think about what they had done and change their mind. They just went out and started making noise. And that's how it ends up in Paul's per, per point of view. That's how it ends up in Galatia. That's how it ends up in Philippi. And so he's dealing with these guys. The Council of the Apostles made the decision and they just kept going. So how is it that they're able to gain an audience? How is it that, that you can have an official meeting of the apostles in Jerusalem and they say, no, this is not the answer to the question of where to put your faith and still have these guys go out and get a following because it is subtle. Because it mixes truth with lies. It's, 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 it's often easy and the church finds itself oftentimes shouting the loudest against the most obvious falsehoods and yet remaining silent on the subtle things. Remaining silent where false teaching sneaks its way in. They were saying at the time, Jesus plus something else. It appealed to the desire for control that they had in their hearts that you and I still have in our hearts. It's, it's grace plus freedom. It's grace plus or baptism. Grace plus communion. Grace plus church membership. Today, as I mentioned a moment ago, we have this false concept that, that the evidence of true faith is tolerance of all sin. That if you really want to look like Jesus, you just have to, to wink, nod, and smile at all the stuff that's going on. And invite it into the church. And they're, they're raising up a false dynamic that says, hey, if you, if, you really, if you really have experienced the grace of God, you're not going to call out sin and we don't have time this morning, and I don't know if I have the ability this morning to explain to you uh, that, that we can champion, we can shout, we can lean into the God who is love and still say sin is sin. And ladies and gentlemen, I know full well if you read anything, if you watch anything, if you listen to anyone, you are being pressed in, and, and whether you recognize it or not, you are being asked to make a false choice between being a loving Christian or being a Christian that understands that God said some things don't belong. 
and standing up for it. I read a news article just this week. There's a Christian college in Texas that it had a, a, a decade-long contract with a local school, not Texas, I'm sorry, Arizona. Decade-long contract with the Phoenix Area School District where the students from this Christian college could go to the, to the public school and, and do their student teaching and, and, and you know, satisfy their requirements to become school teachers. And a school board member of the Phoenix Area School District, Glendale and Phoenix School District, Unified School District, said, no, they can't, we're not, we're going to end the contract with that Christian university because I looked at their website and they espouse biblical pictures of marriage and they espouse biblical truth on gender and identity and sexuality and we don't want those teachers in our school because they're not tolerant enough. And here's the false equivalency, folks. If you take the position the Bible says, the automatic brand that you're going to wear is that you're somehow hateful. And since God is love, you can't be hateful and love God, so you must be the false church. Do you see how they flip the whole thing around? When you and I, as the believer, we need to be able to stand on truth and say, God is love, and I, because I am loved by him, I am to love, and I am to care for, and I am to minister to, and I am to call into the darkness, no matter where we find these people, and we're to call them into the light of the gospel. But in doing so, we cannot lie to them. And so I would just offer to you, ladies and gentlemen, on this particular issue, the subtlety of the false teaching is not just, not just that the devil might pick off a few on the fringes, that as we look around the sheep in the room today, we got to worry that one or two of you might fall under the sway of some false teaching and then get off sideways. The problem is the whole thing gets contaminated. And we no longer preach truth. And we no longer stand for truth. And we've exchanged the truth for a lie, as the scripture says. We need to dare to be churches. We need to dare to be people who can stand on truth in love who can say to those in the most desperate places that they've been duped, that they've they've been blinded. It's not a question of, of, of us versus them. It's a question of eternity. And so I don't I don't I don't see sinners as my enemy. But I will not sacrifice truth to gain an audience and acceptance with them. Because to do so is to damn them and disqualify myself. Can't we we stand and bring the love and the gospel of Christ without the caricature that the world paints of the church? Can't we recognize the subtlety of false teaching? Can't we recognize the viciousness of false teaching and stand against it in the meekness we're called to in Christ? Can you not both be bold and humble? I believe we can. But for for hundreds of years, we've been told that the church either has to be silent or it has to be accommodating. And so we have a whole bunch of quiet churches and we have a whole bunch of churches shouting the wrong stuff. And I'm here to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that the warning that Paul gives us That that, that the reality of what was happening in that day is is transferable to what is happening in this day. And you and I need to recognize the dangers of false teaching and false teachers in their subtleness. And we need to be a people who are willing to not be silent and not be capitulating. But to stand firm. Here's the bottom line, ladies and gentlemen. Nobody gets saved believing lies. Nobody. Nobody. And so when we as a church... When we, when we bend to the wind of the culture to such a degree that we can no longer call what we speak the gospel, we are trading temporary acceptance for eternal influence. It's, it's I'll give you a really bad example. I was in, uh, I want to lighten the mood a little bit here. I was in uh, fourth grade. And there was a girl in my homeroom class who I thought was pretty cute. And so I wanted her to think I was pretty cute. And she was a huge, rabid fan of Prince, the singer. Like, wore the t-shirts every day, had all the albums, that's all she talked about. So guess who I was a big fan of for about three days? (laughs) Prince. 
we'd be sitting at our little table cluster, and there'd be a couple other guys there, and when I, they were always competition, right? And one of those guys was saying to her, she said, I don't know how you can listen to that guy. He's horrible. And she was getting offended. So I jumped in to defend her taste in Prince because I just wanted her to have a high opinion of me. I didn't care one who, I didn't even know who Prince was. Never heard of him until then, right? You see, when we get motivated by something to, to capitulate, when we get motivated to, hey, I'll adopt that position because I want five minutes of popularity, what happens? No, you know, if you want to widen the margins of your musical taste to get somebody to like you, you know, whatever. But when we widen the margins of what truth is, to get this group or that individual or this person to, to, to think we're cool, to think we're plugged in, to think we're cutting edge, to think we're on the right side of history, and we sacrifice the gospel of Jesus Christ, ladies and gentlemen, we are in trouble. And I don't care how popular, famous, well-read, well-written, rich, what, I don't care how... I don't care who the person is. Paul, we already looked at in Galatians, says, I don't care if it's me or an angel. If we give you something other than truth, it is to be accursed. And we're to, and we're to come away from it. We're to step away from that. The stakes are far too high. This false teaching is dangerous because it is subtle. It sneaks in. It mingles truth with lies. It takes even good things and twist them so that we might end up in the wrong place. Can I encourage you? Be, be vigilant on this issue. But it's not only dangerous because it's subtle. It's dangerous as we've been looking at because it is not compatible with the gospel. It is not compatible with the gospel. Look at verse 3 again. For we are the true circumcisions who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. The contrast here is between faith-based righteousness and a fleshly one. Do outward signs mean something inwardly? The false teacher said a person had to perform certain rituals, in this case, circumcision, so that they could be found in Christ. And Paul reminds them that that is not the case. He says we glory in God. He gets the credit, not what I do in my flesh. That, that's, that's, that's the clear dynamic we have there. And to mingle our work with God's work is, is to deviate from the gospel. There is no room in the gospel for Jesus plus something. There's no room in truth with, with the truth of God's word plus something I like, plus something that is popular today, plus something that, that gets me points with this group or that group. There's no room for that. For by grace you have been saved through faith. It's a gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast. That, that's the, that's the, 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 the promise of Scripture. And so false teaching is dangerous because it is absolutely not compatible with the gospel. And that has far-reaching impact, ladies and gentlemen, far-reaching consequences for you and I in the church. Because what that means for you and I is we, we are not called to the business of dressing up the gospel. We are not called to the business of taking God's truth, taking, taking the gospel of Jesus Christ and somehow shining it up in a different way for a different generation. I'll be honest, I have grown more than weary more than weary of, of church leaders and, and, and celebrity pastors and rank-and-file preachers that, that think that it is their job and have been, have been espousing this idea that somehow the gospel needs us to refashion it for a new day. And that sounds good, right? Sounds slick. Everything advances, everything, everything is revamped, everything's, everything's dressed up, and, and, and folks... How far do we have to get away from the real thing before we recognize it? How far? How far do we have to remove ourselves from, from, that, from that moment? It's not compatible. It doesn't fit. It does not adorn the gospel to twist it, to change it, to, to undermine it, to limit it. And, here, and here's, here's why this matters, what we're talking about this morning, folks. Because when I say gospel, you think Jesus died on the cross. And that's true. But we cannot have a gospel that negates why he died on the cross. He didn't die on the cross because we needed help in the sense that we needed, you know, we needed a, a, a cosmic divine body to help us through our hard places. He didn't die on the cross to, to give us an example of sacrifice. He died on the cross because we were sinners condemned in our sin. And in his love, he didn't want that. 
When we take sin out of the gospel, we don't have the gospel. And that's what's happening. What's happening is, is we've, we've, we've taken sin out. We, we've said, we, we've, we've taken what used to be sin, and we've said, well, you know, enough people are enjoying that sin now that we need to classify that as something other than sin. If enough people do the wrong thing, we need to make it the right thing because otherwise we have just too many people on the wrong side of this thing. See how it works? So the narrow path that leads to life is widened so that we can get more people on it and still call it life, still, still make them feel good about that. But if you don't call sin, sin, you don't have the gospel. And so we need to be careful. It's not compatible with the gospel. Thirdly, it's dangerous because it's worthless. It's dangerous because it's worthless. And, and, and you might think to yourself, well, there's lots of worthless things in the life. I just avoid them. Here's why it's dangerous because it's worthless because you're, it's essentially, we, we were down making fishing lures at, at Michelle's dad's yesterday. We, every spring we get together and make some, some lures. And he had a big bag of uh, lead that his, uh, one, of the, one of the cousins or somebody is into that. They make their own weights and sinkers and stuff. And so they had melted down, purified, and, and formed into these bars lead. And uh, it, it was heavier than you thought. This little baggie of lead weighed a lot. It was pretty cool. And, and if, you know, if you coated that with, with a thin coat of gold, you'd think you really had something. And you might be able to find somebody that'll buy it off you. Say, hey, I got this nine-pound bag of gold here. I'll sell it to you for 100 bucks because I don't need it. And you buy it up because it's 100 bucks, and you run it to the store, and you want to trade it in. First thing, the, the, first thing the, 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 the pawn shop or everything's going to do, they're going to get a drill out. They're going to drill a hole in that gold bar. And as soon as the lead starts coming out, they're going to give you nothing. You see, worthless things are dangerous when they're passed off as the genuine article. Worthless things are dangerous when they're passed off as valuable. And so false teaching is dangerous in its worthlessness because it isn't presented as false teaching. Nobody stands up and says, hey guys, I have something else I think you should believe. By the way, it's absolutely false and has no bearing on eternity, but I'd really like you to come to my church anyway. Nobody says it that way. But they will stand before you and say, hey, you know that gospel you've been believing all this time? You know that Jesus you've been following? Well, here's the thing. We discovered something everybody else has missed for the last 2,000 years, and we'd really like to share you the secret that we found. Well, heck, I don't want to miss the secret. Maybe I'll go check it out. Or, hey, that, that guy, you know, he really speaks well, or he writes really well. I, I really like the way he puts it. And you get, you get sold a bill of goods. And it's dangerous because it's, it's absolutely worthless. The false teachers puff themselves up as good examples of, of how works gets the job done. I love what Paul does in response to that. He says, okay, you want to compare resumes? I'll bring mine to the party. And he lays down his resume in this third chapter. And he says to all of the false teachers who were saying, look at us, we're the example, look at us, we're the way. He said, hey, guess what? I'm better than you at everything you said you can do. I'm more connected. I'm more zealous. I was more well-known. I put my money where my mouth was every time when I was following your system. And guess what I came to the conclusion of? Worthless, useless, garbage. He uses the word, I count it all in verse 8. That's the word for an accounting term. In other words, he said, hey, guess what? I got to the end of all of that, and I was bankrupt before a holy God. Which, by the way, if you read Jesus' sermon in Matthew, that's exactly where you need to start. <laughs> the poor in spirit. They're the ones that are blessed. They're the ones that figure it out. And so Paul says, hey, I was broke. I was done. I counted it as worthlessness. Legalism and all false teaching, to be, to be quite honest, puts the burden of saving ourselves on ourselves. It elevates man above God. It erases the gospel and is therefore very dangerous. And you've, you, I know you've likely heard the illustration before. We used to use it all the time in youth ministry. That if I, if I were going to bake you a chocolate cake and I listed all the ingredients in the chocolate cake I was going to make and, and there was just going to be just a little tiny bit of dog poop in it. But everything else was still good. Would you eat the cake? And all the kids, of course, say no, except that one kid that always says, yeah, I'd eat it because he wants to gross everybody out and make everybody think he's cool. We'd avoid it like the plague. Why? Because I don't care how good 99.9% .9 of the cake is. I don't want to risk it. I'm going to get the bite with the dog poop in it. Apologies if that's too gross for some of you. I, youth kids like that kind of thing. I didn't have an illustration for adults. But ladies and gentlemen, we're, 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 we're buying this stuff. And 99.9% .9 of it might be good stuff, might sound right, might, 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 be, might be rooted in, in something in the past that was right and good, but somewhere that, that these people get off track and they start putting the wrong stuff in and, and we just keep eating it. 
And it, it's spiritual poison. It, it's, 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 it's killing the church. And so we've got to recognize it's dangerous. But he gives us the flip side of this. And I'll, I'll move quickly through this part and we can, we can head to the Lord's table. Those at home, uh, be aware we're having communion this morning. We'd encourage you to, to get together what you have for that. Let's look real quickly at the benefits of faith, verses 8 through 11. I'll, I'll give you these quick for your answer key, and then, and then we, can, we, can, we can move on. Benefits of faith. First of all, we get to know Christ, verse 8. We get to know him. Look at what it says. It says, more than that, I count all things to be lost in the view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. That word knowing is the idea not just of head knowledge, but it speaks of a personal experiential knowledge. It is to know and be known. It is intimacy with Christ. The very thing false teaching promises you, it cannot deliver. The very thing that you are desiring and seeking is found through faith. It's found through, through what we looked at in the Bereans in receiving, examining, and believing truth. And so you get to know Christ. Legalism cannot do that for us. We have union with Christ, verses 9 and 10, and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed even, it says, to his death. We have union with Christ. To be in Christ is to be identified with him. We share in his righteousness that's imputed to our account. We share in his power. We share in his sufferings. And Paul says, I want that. I want that union with Christ to be fully known, to be fully realized in my life. That's that's one of the ways false teaching hurts us. It's it's, it's the cheat on your diet. It's, it's the having, you know, the salad and the chicken breast for supper and then going out and having a triple-decker Sunday with all the toppings. Because it, it takes away from, from that union. It, it, it moves us. When we're not investing as Paul was, when we're not in, when we're not in a position as Paul was to pursue after Christ, to, to live ever more in that union we have with Christ, that if we're not doing that, we're doing something else. And if we're doing something else, we're moving away from that. And so it becomes filler. It becomes a distraction. But the benefit of faith is we have union with Christ. And then verse 11, we have a future hope. He's already said to live as Christ and to die as gain. But look at verse 11. In order that it may attain to the resurrection, he says, from the dead. Every person who comes by grace through faith in the finished work of Christ has a future hope and glory that is assured and that is settled. Why would we trade that future hope for five minutes of popularity with somebody who hates Jesus? Doesn't make sense. And why would we leave someone in that place knowing they have no hope while we're sitting over here with hope? We need to take that truth to them. We don't need to mask it. We don't need to dumb it down. We don't need to sanitize it of what offends. We need to take the gospel of Christ and say, hey, I know you don't agree with me. I know you think I'm a bigot. I know you think I'm closed-minded, but I want you to know something. Jesus loves you and so do I. And the gospel says you're a sinner that needs saved. That's our job. That's what he calls us to. The benefit of faith is we have a future hope. Not a hope so, but an assurance, a settled reality. The scriptures, every time it talks about the glorification of the believer, always talks about it in the past tense. You have been glorified with Christ. We're reminded that we are not yet what we will be, but when we see him, we will be like him. Folks, that gets us out of bed in the morning, doesn't it? The the reality of the return of Christ and the kingdom to come and and our acceptance within that kingdom by faith alone ought to get us excited. And it ought to change how we see the people who don't look forward to that. It ought to change how how we engage with those folks. We referenced Acts 15. Shortly after Acts 15, there's the story of the Philippian jailer in Acts 16, which I think, uh, pay attention to the order of the narrative in the scriptures. They're not, they're not, inter- they're not, they're not you know, disjointed stories. It all goes together. And so soon after the council establishes the fact that, that it's salvation by grace through faith, that it's not, the, it's not the legalism that is being presented, we have the narrative of the Philippian jailer who upon hearing and seeing the power of the gospel falls in shaking at the feet of Paul and Silas and says, what must I do to be saved? And the answer comes then as it comes now. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And and, and, and it it is a a, a glaring narrative that, that indicts 
the false teachers of Paul's day that wanted a different answer to that question. And the story goes on to say that he and his household came to faith on that night. And it's a question that's asked even today. As you and I watch people stumble and fumble around in the dark, chasing after an answer to the question, what do I put my trust in? Where, where, do, where, do I, where is faith well spent? We have to have an answer. We have to say, Jesus, the finished work of Christ on the cross. Not plus anything else. Come to Christ, repent, believe, and you'll be saved. And so Paul says to you and I, he says to the church, beware. Beware of false teachers. They're dangerous. They will rob you of your joy. They will rob you of your testimony. They will lead those that you care about into darkness. Beware, beware, beware. And so I would just say to you, be the Bereans we read about a little bit ago. Be those that, that receive truth, that examine truth against the scriptures and believe that which is true. Now, I'll leave you with, with Paul's admonition this and the elders can come forward. He says this in 1 Thessalonians 5 on this subject. Verses 21 and 22. But examine everything carefully. Sound familiar? Examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good and abstain from every form of evil. Ladies and gentlemen, that's our challenge in a day that is hard to answer. In a day where the, 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 the lies come fast and they come furious. But he says, examine. Examine it, everything carefully. Hold to what is right. and Reject what is not. That's our standard. And that's our call. If the men would come, please, this morning. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity that we have, Lord, to engage your truth. And Lord, we don't engage it arrogantly. We don't engage your truth by saying, we're right, everyone else is wrong. We acknowledge the existence of honest debate and questions and the complexities of spiritual things. But Lord, when it comes to where people ought to put their confidence, we cannot be wavering. Help us. Help us to do as your word has said, as your word has commanded, we looked at just a moment ago, Lord, help us to examine everything carefully. Let us not be lazy in what we consume and what we promote. Lord, help us to hold to that which is true and to step away, to throw away, to cast off, to abstain from all forms of evil. Lord, give us eyes to see. Give us courage to stand to your honor and to your glory. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. As we come to our communion time this morning, uh, for those visiting with us, I invite you, this is a, uh, the Lord's table, it is not mine, the elders of Verndale Alliance Churches. So if you're here today and you know Christ by faith, you have had your sins forgiven uh, because you have put your faith in Jesus Christ and received the grace of God freely, then you're welcome at this table. We ask as the elements come that you please hold on to them until all have been served and we'll partake together. I remind you to please take both cups, the top and the bottom, the cracker will, will be on the bottom, the juice will be on the top. Take both of those, hold on to them until all have been given theirs. If you're here this morning and you don't know the Lord, I would encourage you to, two things. First of all, just allow the elements to pass. We're not, we're not keeping score here. You're not trying to impress anyone. But more importantly, if you're not a believer here, I would encourage you to settle that question today. That even before the elements get to your row, you can come to Christ as the Philippian jailer and you can say, I, I'm a sinner. And I, I need the grace of God and I need to receive that. I believe that Jesus loves me, that he died for my sins, that he rose again on the third day. And invite that, invite him in, invite him to forgive you. Repent of your sins, turn from your sin and turn towards God in faith. If you do that, even in the moments that I'm talking or the moments that they're coming, when the elements get there, would you partake re with rejoicing? As this, the first day of the rest of your life, the first day of your new life in Christ. If you're not able to do that, you have questions, but I encourage you, grab me at the door. At the end of the service, the elders will be available in front for you to pray with. If you'd like to come forward and ask questions, to pray with someone, we'd encourage you to do that. This is the most critical and the most important question you'll ever answer. Where do I put my trust? Where do I, where do I put my hope for what comes after this? 
And so we want to help you answer that correctly. If that's you this morning, I'd encourage you, avail yourself. Avail yourself to those who can pray with, to communicate with, to instruct, to teach, that you might receive that freely. Gentlemen, would you come please? Would you pray with me? Father, I'm so thankful for you. Uh, Lord, I'm thankful for uh, this opportunity we have to come and be at your table. Lord, I'm thankful uh, for the message that was just shared. Uh, Lord, for the truth uh, that, Lord, it is you and through you alone, uh, Lord, we have access. Lord, we have salvation. Uh, it's not through our works, but it's our faith in you. And Lord, because of that, Lord, we have the ability to be your children. Our sins are washed away. We are made clean in your sight. Uh, Lord, we are welcome at your table. Uh, Lord, both here and forever, the great hope that we have that we will spend eternity with you uh, because of what you have done for us, Lord. And, uh, help us to be grateful. Help us to be thankful uh, for that, Lord. Uh, we love you because you first loved us, Lord. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would just bless this time. Uh, and, Lord, just that we would appreciate it for what it is, Lord. And we just ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul records for us in 1 Corinthians 11, For I have received from the Lord that which also I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me.
As we close our service this morning, uh, two reminders for you. One is, again, if you'd like prayer uh, for a spiritual matter, a physical matter, the elders are available to anoint and to pray over any who would like to come. If you'd like to come forward to pray with or for someone else, we encourage you to do that as well. Also, as you leave this morning, an usher will be at the back door to receive the benevolent offering. Uh, Again, this is an offering that we receive once a month on this Sunday. And we use that offering exclusively to help with the financial needs of our church family and the community as we are able. So I would encourage you, if you are facing a financial difficulty, something that we can come alongside and minister to you in, uh, in some financial way, please reach out to myself, one of the staff, one of our elders, that we might be able to bless you as the Lord has blessed us. With that, if you're able, please to stand as the singers and musicians come once more and we close our service together.